All right, just um, going going through the setup again. The yeah, the sign up is free, um, and there's no card or anything required, so you can just go in, uh, sign up, and you should be good to go. Um, if you have any issues, let me know after the workshop or uh, join a Slack channel, which I'll share in a, in a second, or you can email me or, or connect with me on LinkedIn. So what this workshop is, uh, this is hopefully a super friendly introduction to computer vision uh, with kind of no experience required, but knowing some Python will probably be helpful when we get to the coding portion. Uh, but again, don't worry if you've never done Python before, if you've never, never done a lot of coding, um, as long as you're willing to just kind of stick through and maybe not know 100% what's happening all the time, um, I think you'll have a lot of fun. So what we're going to cover is we're going to briefly go over kind of applications and basic intuition of computer vision and deep learning. And then we're going to go into how to label your own data so that after this workshop, you can actually um, you know, solve your own problems using computer vision. Um, and then we're going to jump into code and train a model. So you actually go through and train a model yourself. If you've never done any deep learning or computer vision, it'll be awesome because it'll be your, your first model that you've done. Um, and, and just keep in mind, you can't learn everything in two hours, um, especially when it comes to something like computer vision or deep learning. There's a lot of stuff to learn, uh, but you can learn enough to get started and actually start solving problems right after this, and then hopefully be really excited about computer vision. Uh, parts of this may feel fast paced or challenging just depending on your experience, but that's totally okay. Um, again, like, I think you'll learn a lot just by sticking through it. So. Um, and one of the most important things is to kind of keep learning after the workshop. So if you are interested in kind of the field of computer vision and you want to keep going, uh, you know, I'll point you to resources after that, after the workshop. A little bit about me. Uh, my name is Sage Elliott. I'm a machine learning developer evangelist at sixskill.com. Sixskill. Uh, we do awesome stuff with machine learning, computer vision, IoT, and we also make tools to make it easier for everyone else to do those things. So for about the past decade, I've worked in software and hardware with startups and agencies in Seattle and also in uh, Central Florida area. I really like making things with technology, uh, whether it's like hardware, robotics, uh, computer vision applications. Um, I think they're all really, really cool. And I, and I love getting people interested in, in these kind of uh, new topics or fields that maybe they've never touched before. And you can stay connected with me at uh, sagelight.com, two L's and two T's, LinkedIn. Um, Sage Elliott, two L's and two T's. Again, I should come up there. I should probably be one of the first people. Uh, feel free to connect with me there. And then uh, on Twitter, I'm uh, Sage Codes. Actually, let me just share these links real quick. Um, also, this, this top link here. So this is a Slack channel where I will be in. Um, and if you have any questions, especially around computer vision labeling uh, or building your own project afterwards, that's the best place. You can you know, DM me directly in there or share in one of the general chats. That way other people can kind of see, you know, if it's not sensitive data or anything, um, they can see, you know, how you learned or how, uh, how you solved a certain problem that you ran into. Um, and I see a couple of questions about signing up in the chat and yeah, it's free. Um, there's no card required to get started. Then there's uh, kind of a, a trial period slash um, a limitation on kind of the total amount of labels, uh, but it's totally enough to get started for kind of like a hobby type project. Uh, about you. So normally I would love to introduce uh, yourselves here, but the RCP is pretty high. There's almost 50 people in here. Uh, so I thought it'd be better to wait till after the class. So again, if you wanna join that Slack channel, there's an introductions channel, or you could just use general. And I'd love to kind of you know hear more about what you're working on, why you're interested in computer vision. And it's cool if you post it in there because other people can see it too and you can stay connected with each other. It's one thing I really miss about um, doing in-person events is like connecting to people and like learning about how, you know, what they're working on and how we can help each other. So feel free to do that in there. And then also uh, if you wanna you know, shout out right now in the chat, you know, anything like if you wanna do a quick introduction in the chat, you can totally do that now too. Mark said uh, he's also, oh, he's in Melbourne, Florida. That's awesome. Yeah, that's funny because like uh, uh, not that many people have, have lived there <laughs> or are from there. It's a pretty small city in central Florida. Um, I'd love to stay connected and learn more about like where you're even, you know, working in manufacturing. It'd be funny if we worked in the same places. <laughs> Someone saying, how can I connect with you for any virtual events like this? Uh, just LinkedIn, or um, if you actually go to sixskill.com slash events, everything will be posted there if you want to keep an eye on it. 
I also usually cross post them over to sagela.com. I have a speaking tab there. So all the events I'm speaking at should be in there. Someone said they're from New Zealand. That's awesome. It's always really cool to see people watching from you know, far away. I'm in, I'm in Seattle, Washington, not that far from Canada. <laughs> awesome, all right, I'm gonna keep going, but so cool to see where everyone's watching from. And again, if you wanna introduce yourself in Slack, I'd love to stay connected and talk more later. Um, I will also be hanging around after this workshop. So I wanna get through all the content, um, you know, for anyone who doesn't wanna hang around you know, past the, the, the timeline. Uh, but I'll be hanging out. So if you want to keep talking and we can go through more introductions or just go deeper into anything we cover um, or maybe get to questions that I don't get to answering. So feel free to hang out afterwards and I'll be here to, to talk more. Set up again, just for anyone who came in. Usually some people come in a little bit later. And uh, so we're going to be using an online data science coding environment called Google Colab. So again, you just need a modern web browser, a Google account, and then you'll want to sign up for the sense data annotation tool. Again, there's no card or anything required there. Just go in for the um, kind of get, get started for free trial. Someone said, are we going to get the recording? Yeah, it'll go up on a YouTube channel. Um, I will do a follow-up email probably sometime tomorrow or Friday and I'll, I'll link to all the resources. So if you have to jump out a little early or anything, um, you'll, you should be able to get everything you need. And if you don't stay connected with me and ping me. All right, so what is computer vision? It's a pretty big field, um, but I would kind of boil it down to how computers gain understanding from images or videos. And uh, there can be other types of data as well that kind of goes into computer vision. So someone was talking about LIDAR, right? That's like a point cloud kind of clustering thing and kind of, kind of a little bit different than images, um, but you have to use computer vision to look at that data and understand it as well. And you can also turn audio into images. So if you've ever seen, DJs or anyone visualizing audio as some sort of visual like wavelength thing. Um, I, I forget what's called a spectrograph or a spectrogram. I always get them confused. One is the tool and one is what the wavelength is. I want to say it's a spectrograph. Um, and you can also run those through a computer vision model as well. So like if you're trying to detect a certain uh, voice or a noise or you know some sort of anomaly, you can actually use computer vision for certain audio use cases as well. So here's a little uh, sample of a demo we have that we've trained. And what this is doing is detecting trucks, right? Um, and you can see this green one is kind of classified as a moving truck. And this is classified as a stationary truck. All these red ones are. And you can see, you know, it drives around, it's green. Um, and, and there's a couple things to notice here is one, you can see it's drawing a box around it. So this is kind of localizing where the object is saying, you know, within this image or the frame of the video, uh, here's where I think a truck is. And then you can see there's another layer here is kind of this red pixels or the green pixels here. And that's actually drawing where um, not just kind of generalized where the truck is, but actually the pixels it thinks belongs to the actual truck. So that's called um, in image uh, or instant segmentation, where it's actually segmenting out the actual object. And then if you just had these bounding boxes, that's what we would call just object detection. So you know where something is in the image, but you don't know precisely what pixels belong to the object. Um, in this case, we do. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about these um, in a second. So why I love computer vision, um, I think it's an amazing interface in the world. We're already doing really, really cool stuff with it today. We'll talk a little bit about some interest, industry use cases, but I already saw some people talking about in the chat as well, like you know, using robots to navigate because vision is such a good way of doing that. Um, you know, even if you have other sensor data, like if you're, you're looking at um, ultrasonic or LIDAR or even GPS, um, computer vision applications are, are, are really powerful to understand like what the things are you're looking at um, or how to even modify your behavior depending on what's in front of you. So who uses computer vision? Uh, more and more companies are using computer vision across just multiple fields. I just wanna talk about a few, some you've probably definitely heard of, and then maybe some you haven't. And then I'd love to hear um, in the chat, your thoughts or, or other industries that I didn't mention that, you, that either you've seen stuff or you're interested in using computer vision in. So I don't know how many people um, have heard of this, this small little local company to Seattle called Amazon. Um, has anyone heard of them before? Obviously, most people have probably heard of Amazon. 
Um, but <laughs> yeah, they, they sell books. I think they do something with computer visions and books or something. Um, so they use computer vision in a lot of different places. And one thing that's really cool, has anyone been into an Amazon Go store before? There's several in Seattle. I know they're in other cities. I don't know if they're out of the country yet. Um, they're really interesting. So you walk in and you look up and it's just a giant array of cameras and processing units that I think do like real time live processing of the camera feeds. And you walk in, you scan a QR code on your phone. It kind of lets you in this little door. And then uh, you pick up what you want, like a, like a grocery store. And then you walk out and that's it. Like it feels like you're stealing because you don't actually do a checkout process. It keeps track with computer vision what you pick up and kind of assigns that value to you like while well, it tracks you around the store. And then when you walk out, it charges you based on what you picked up. And it's really, really interesting. Um, especially the first time you do it, it just feels wrong. Cause you're like, oh, I don't have to pay. Um, but right now it's really good during COVID. Like I sometimes go to an Amazon Go grocery that's near me just because there's no lines, there's less people you have to interact with. It's really interesting. Scott said, Walmart has a test store in Arkansas like that as well. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, we'll not be surprised if uh, many more big uh, grocery stores or physical stores start doing something like this. And then Amazon Go is selling that technology as well. So some of the stores will probably partner with them in the future, I'm guessing, and just have that. Someone said it takes five to 15 minutes to receive the receipt after you leave the store. Yeah, som sometimes I've had it be really fast. Sometimes I've had it be pretty long. And uh, I have no idea, so, so don't, uh, don't, uh, don't take this for 100% of what they're actually doing. But my guess is that it probably has some sort of confidence score of how confident it was that those were all the items you got. And then they probably have someone um, maybe manually review it or something just to make sure. And if it's not correct, correct it. That's just a, a hunch I have. I don't know if that's actually why it takes so long, but I could see that happening, right? Like if I was like, ooh, it's like 99% confident that that's what I picked up, great. Just go ahead and do it. Um, but if it's like 70%, sure, maybe you want to have a human in the loop, kind of look at that and then approve it. Um, and then they also use it for delivery robots, you know, self-driving cars. They recently acquired the company Zooks, which is a self-driving car company. They also use it in product listings um, from what I've heard too. So like, right, you're uploading images or people are uploading images to Amazon in the storefront. So I think there's a lot of analysis they do there, probably to make sure that it's like, say for, for work photos. And also I heard they were doing it for like looking at counterfeit products and stuff like that, which is interesting to think about. Um, Google, Google Photos. If you have a Google Photos account, you might've seen like you can search for dogs and it'll bring up all the dog pictures you took in your phone. Um, YouTube content filtering, self-driving cars. Google has been doing a lot of cool stuff with uh, Waymo, their self-driving car branch. You know, Tesla, self-driving cars. Tesla is really interesting too, because they don't even use use LiDAR in their car right now. As far as I know, I think it's all cameras. Um, so they're like kind of just betting on cameras all the way, computer vision all the way for self-driving, which is really interesting. Facebook, face tagging, you probably upload a photo, seen a, a, a face automatically tagged or something like that. Um, but here are some other really cool industries that I like to think about or that I'm really excited about um, that aren't your traditional big tech industries. And these are like some things we actually work on at Six Skill too. So like agriculture, um, we do like crop and animal monitoring um, and counting, construction, site monitoring. So someone in the chat earlier brought up they're doing LIDAR of construction sites. And I, I'd be interested to hear what the use case around that, if you could share it, because you can do kind of like monitoring or um, I know someone working on a self-driving tractor, which is pretty interesting. So it'd be like self-driving cars, but in a construction zone, which has different kind of uh, risks and environments associated with it. Manufacturing, Mark earlier was talking about manufacturing. And like I said, that's actually how I got started at Computer Vision was doing quality assurance um, at a, a hardware company I was working at. And we just had a really complicated part and everyone would, would give me different answers if it was good or bad. And so I was like, I can probably figure that out with Computer Vision. So it was really cool. Um, supply chain and like checking on, you know, products as they're coming in. Oil and gas, it's a cool industry we uh, work in as well, doing like oil and gas, uh, monitoring safety and uh, kind of other, you know, like leak detection and stuff. And then um, healthcare, x-ray diagnostics, like radiology, MRI scans, medicine research. All these are like really cool, interesting fields um, where you can do a lot of really amazing stuff today with computer vision. And uh, you just see more and more, I think, pop up in all these fields. And there's a lot of, um, you know, unique approaches to everything.
does anyone have in the chat anything they want to uh, share or like any cool use cases that they're excited about or they've seen or that they're working on or that they want to work on? Um, and, and by no means is this everything. These are just some that are at top of, top of mind for me. Uh, drones is a really cool thing. I see people talking a lot about like drone navigation as well. Uh, a lot of the stuff we do around um, computer vision is um, with models. So let me see real quick. If you go to sixskill.com, uh, we have some samples in the kind of header video here. It's some of our industry partners too, if you just kind of want to look into that, which is cool. Uh, let me see if this, here's some little samples too that just might be fun to look at. Like this is looking at people. Um, this is, well, I'll show this again, but it's doing pose detection and actually classifying like what yoga pose people are in. Uh, pill detection, so classifying which pills are what. Uh, here's a little gas detection. So it's actually seen the, the gas as it uh, leaks out, which is actually way harder um, than you might think. Cool, I see some cool stuff coming in. Um, Ron said it worked for a company helping uh, use machine learning to observe the manufacturing process of wind turbines. Oh, that sounds cool. It sounds right up my alley. Manufacturing is really fun. All right, I'm gonna go on to um, kind of just uh, computer vision deep learning. So computer vision isn't always tied to deep learning, uh, but in the past decade or so, deep learning um, in the field of computer vision has been dominating all these complex problems. So almost anything you see probably in the news or really complex use cases is probably using deep learning behind the scenes. But I just wanted to mention that, that computer vision and deep learning can be separated out. Like you can do a lot of advanced image processing. And sometimes if you're not in a uh, changing environment and you're doing something very static, you can totally kind of use uh, sometimes simple image processing, right? To do something or look at something in like different colors, color threshold and stuff like that. <clears throat> All right. so. Um, uh, real quick on deep learning. So if you're not familiar with it, I'm just going to talk at a high level to it, but don't worry. It's not too scary. This is just kind of at a high level how it works. So you have kind of a function and you could think of this as a programming function, like in Python or whatever code you're used to, or you could think of it as a uh, mathematical function. And what you're trying to do is optimize that function to make predictions based on new data that you give it. So how you, how you get to that spot is you feed a lot of training data. So a classic example when you get started in computer vision is training a classifier to classify if an image is a dog or a cat. And so what you would do is you would feed this, um, this function that you're training, you know, potentially thousands of images of a, a dog or a cat. Um, and then you would have a label tied to it. So you would feed a picture of a cat, you say, this is a cat. You would feed a picture of a dog, you'd say, this is a dog. And then over time, um, kind of all, it would look at the, the whole data set that in one iteration, and then it would do another iteration on, on the data set. And it would start learning features that make up a cat versus a dog. So when I pick up on that, the nose looks way different for a cat and the ears maybe look different than, than a dog would. And then once you train it, however many times it can be, a ton of different iterations. There's different ways of training models. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, you know, then you would feed it a new picture of a cat that it's never seen before. It learned from all these other pictures of a cat, but you give it a picture that it's never seen before of a cat, you would feed it in and then, then hopefully it would predict it correctly saying it's a cat. Or if you fed it a picture of a dog, hopefully it would predict that it's a dog. And that's what we're going to be doing today with um, geese. So I have a data set of geese I've collected. We're gonna label it. And then you're going to pass in all this labeled data saying, you know, here are the bounding boxes around these geese. And it's going to learn what makes up a goose or not. <laughs> and then we'll feed it images it's never seen. And hopefully it will make correct predictions of uh, if it's a goose or not. And here's some links I'm going to share in the chat real quick, uh, but we won't really go into these. But if you just kind of want to kind of want to learn a little bit more about deep learning, um, this is a fun little spot to visualize a, a neural net. And then this is something to visualize something called a convolutional neural network, which is actually the popular neural network used in computer vision right now. And, but again, you don't need to know all these like uh, low level details or anything to just get started with it. Well, we're going to use Python and we're going to use a library that makes it fairly easy to get started. 
Um, a note on transfer learning. So with most popular um, deep learning frameworks, like the ones we're going to use, and, and probably almost all the ones you're going to use if you have this as a career or use it in your work, um, they come loaded with pre-trained weights. And what this means is you can load an architecture uh, for, for computer vision in this case. There's um, a lot of really big ones out there and we'll talk about those in a second and like which ones you might wanna look into for different problems. But so you'll load in this uh, computer vision architecture that you know will probably perform very well and then it, you're going to load in pre-trained weights. And it turns out that if you do that, you start with these pre-trained weights that was trained on, uh, there's several famous image uh, data sets like Coco data set or ImageNet data set. Um, and it's been trained on like thousands of images for probably thousands of hours and can get really high accuracy on those types of objects. But it turns out if you uh, load those weights in and then you change those weights to fit what you're looking for. So in this case, the, the goose, object detection that we're going to do, um, you actually don't need to train it as much. And it, you get really, really, usually you'll get really accurate results pretty quickly. So you're going to see, we're going to take around um, 100 and something images and we're only gonna train for something like, it, it depends on which GPU you, you will get, but it'll be something like five or 10 minutes. Um, it's only gonna be like 300 iterations through the data set and it's gonna actually perform very well. And the reason we can do that is because we're using transfer learning, which you can just really think of not starting from zero right now. And a good rule of thumb I always talk about, because people always ask like, how many images do you need? And it really does depend on your data set. So there isn't a clear answer for this, um, but uh, just a rule of thumb for me, if I'm doing like a hobby project or something, I'll, I try to get around 200 images of the thing to train on, uh, but it can really vary depending on how complex and varying the types of detections you're trying to do is. Uh, but without transfer learning, you probably need thousands of images and a lot more time. And you're going to see that you can actually get results pretty quickly, which is awesome. So some types of computer visions, uh, uh, actually real quick, before we get into some of the types, uh, does anyone have any questions? I feel free to just post it in the chat. Someone asked, where can I find the slides? Um, I will share them out in a follow-up email. Someone said, where do you get those pre-trained models from? So the, um, we'll, I'll talk about that when we get to the code. So we're going to use um, uh, something called Detectron 2. I'll get to that in a second, which is like a PyTorch wrapper. And so whether you're using like PyTorch or TensorFlow, those are the most kind of two uh, common frameworks. Um, you'll say, I want to use this type of model architecture. And then almost all of those model architectures will have pre-trained weights that as an option, you get to bring in. So I'll show you how to do that in our version of the code. Um, that we're going to do today, but there's, you know, if you use TensorFlow, it might be slightly different. We're going to be using something with PyTorch um, underneath it. But essentially just say, give me the weights in, in some way or another in the code as you're importing the model. Someone said, which is preferable, TensorFlow or PyTorch in terms of difficulty too? Um, everyone will probably just give you a different answer on this. Some people prefer TensorFlow, some people prefer PyTorch. It just kind of has a different style around writing it. And I feel like some people just, you know, I, like might know TensorFlow better, or PyTorch better. Um, and then some communities might also prefer one over another. So I've seen a lot of academic uh, places have taken on PyTorch more and PyTorch has been gaining a lot of popularity, but TensorFlow already had a ton. Um, and, and they essentially kind of do a lot of the same stuff. So I would say get started in one if you haven't done either yet, and then just stick with it for a little bit. And you're, if you're ever curious about the other one, you could go switch over and see what it's about and see if you, you like it better or you don't. Um, and also one thing to keep in mind too is like TensorFlow actually has a lot of, um, like they've been around longer. So they have some interesting concepts around like productionalizing models in different ways for like, TensorFlow Lite, which is like a lighter version that can be deployed on smaller devices. Uh, PyTorch also has PyTorch Mobile. And then TensorFlow also has TensorFlow JS, where you can convert a TensorFlow model to uh, some form of JavaScript model. I haven't messed too much with it myself. So you can actually run the model in a browser. So there could be things to think about like that. Like if you're optimizing for something very specific, uh, some of the frameworks might be better at certain things. But just in terms of getting started, um, I'd say go with either personally. I've done both. Um, a lot of people say they kind of like the writing style of PyTorch um, is what I've heard recently. And there's also another layer called PyTorch Lightning that you can use that makes it even a little bit cleaner in PyTorch. All 
All right, I'm gonna keep going. Um, if I didn't get to your question, again, feel free to ask it later. Um, I will keep looking back at the chat. So some types of computer vision. Uh, computer vision is a, a really big field and we're gonna focus on uh, applications with uh, computer vision and deep learning. And then a lot of these can kind of be combined together in various ways or other kind of layers of an algorithm on top of them to solve different problems. So I'll kind of talk about this as we go. And again, not covering every single thing, but there's uh, quite a bit. So classification. A lot of times this is where you're going to get started if you're doing computer vision. Uh, typically people have you train just a classifier. And what that is, is like that dog and cat example, right? Like I just fed it images and the only label I gave it was saying there's a dog in this photo or there's a cat in this photo. So here's an example. I uh, trained a classifier on dog breeds and then I fed it this image and it predicted it was a Labrador retriever. But you can imagine, right? Like this Labrador retriever is here. What if I had a Chihuahua back here? Um, it would still only return a like one prediction and it wouldn't know that there's two dogs in the photo. So it only knows like what an entire photo, um, what's in the entire photo, what class that would belong to. And so uh, same with the cat and dog example, right? If you had a cat and a dog in the photo, but you only train on images of uh, cat and dog, it would be, it, it would give you some result, but it wouldn't give you maybe the most accurate or correct result because it's just saying like, well, the dog was bigger than the cat. So I'm gonna predict that there's a dog in here. Um, and it, it can be useful. So if you just need to kind of generally classify an image and, and or you're doing pre-processing and you know what's going into your model, uh, classification can be great for it, for, for solving certain problems. Um, and then you have object detection. And this is what we're going to build today. And I think this is really exciting. I think it's a little bit more exciting than a, um, a classifier. And it could be a little bit harder to make if you don't have a good starting point or tutorial to go through. At least when I was getting started with computer vision, it was like, you could train a classifier, you could maybe train some sort of object detection on a pre-made data set, but no one ever went into how to create your own data set. So it was a lot harder to like, kind of figure out how to do your own problems. And so object detection can classify, but also localize where an object is inside the image uh, or a video. Uh, so here, right, we have two geese. There's one goose here and one goose here. Instead of just classifying, yes, there's a goose in here, it's actually saying there's two. And we have a, a general sense of like where they are in the image, right? So you could have, imagine you could have an area um, that's off limit to people or something, and you could be tracking where a person's walking, and then they could go into an area and they could trigger some sort of an alert. But you could also count for this, right? Instead of just saying, yes, there's a goose or no, there's a goose, you, you could actually say there's like, you know, two keys in this photo and do something with that data. And you can also have models uh, that don't just classify one thing, right? So you want to classify like car, other cars on the road if you're doing self driving and people and lane lines and all these different things. Um, you can do that here. Instant segmentation. So I just showed a video with this, uh, with an example of this before. So we're drawing a box. Uh, the box is kind of small here. We can see we're drawing a box around where the object is, but also a pixel, like covering each pixel of where we think that thing is. So in here, this sample is like a, a manufacturing place with a water bottle and then water inside. So you actually get pixel level detail of where something is inside of an image. Um, and in this case, uh, you could do something like, you know, we're tracking water and we're tracking bottle. We're, we're tracking pixels of both of these things. You could do something like a volumetric uh, calculation to see how full a water bottle is based on the water that we're tracking. Or if you were, um, you know, tracking hands or fingers or something like that, you could actually see when it interacts with something else that you're tracking. So you can imagine, right, like two models or a model detecting two things, and then you can do some kind of uh, uh, minor math behind the scenes, like seeing where something is pixel by pixel, and then, um, you know, have a notification or alert or whatever go off, you know, when something collides with, with each other. And then, then just like object detection, right, it's like, uh, we could count and, and do all sorts of different stuff with that data that we're getting. Feature point clustering. Um, I feel like someone mentioned feature points. I oh, know, I think they mentioned LiDAR data. So in this example this is doing a feature point clustering. So uh, here's a, a better looking example where uh, you can actually see this is tracking like kind of different points of the human body. So it goes from like head, neck, um, arms and all the kind of like where the elbow is, where the hand is, legs. And then in this case, it's actually um, detecting what yoga pose people are in. Uh, but you could use this in all sorts of different applications like detecting um, 
the gait of something walking. Uh, it's also common in certain facial applications. So seeing like a uh, mood of a face, right? Like feature points of where the, the mouth is um, and where the eyes are uh, or corners of eyes and stuff like that. And then like those kind of change based on if you're frowning or smiling. Um, so that's another common application for that. Image captioning. Um, so understanding the context of an image, there's ways of training models with uh, kind of other models, like in this case, I, off the top of my head, I'm thinking of like a, a recurrent neural network, which is a different type of neural network where you can actually kind of, um, you can train in a way where it has contextual understanding of things in the image. So here we have this picture of a girl flying a kite on the beach. Um, instead of just detecting like kite, girl, beach, it can actually have some context awareness and saying like, you know, the girl is flying a kite on the beach, which is uh, pretty cool. Generative deep learning. I'm really interested in this field and pretty passionate about it. Um, so there's something called GANs, Generative Adversarial Networks. Um, uh, I think there's a link before I forgot to share that kind of has the, these generated faces. I'll share this link in the chat if you want to look at it. Um, I think this actually has it. So there's realistic looking faces that aren't real because they were trained on a data set, of a whole bunch of faces, and then uh, they generate fake ones. And it's kind of scary how real they look. And I've actually worked quite a bit with GANs doing some cool stuff. Here's a project that I worked on with someone. Uh, we were generating uh, housing designs. Uh, so we would take a famous architect, have a whole bunch of their images feed into a GAN, and then it would generate original images like designs based on that, uh, which is really interesting. And this picture here on the, the right hand side, this is actually um, some stuff that happened while I was training that specific model. So we were training it to, to make really cool arch architecture designs. Um, but before it got to that point, if you ever see a GAN train, it's like really crappy looking at first. It's just like staticky and stuff. And then shapes start to emerge. And this is like a weird in-between phase of like, it looks like really cool art to me or like space or something like that. Um, but not quite like any real buildings I've seen. So it was this interesting space between realistic looking and just, you know, uh, nonsense. But it, I thought it was really cool art. So there, I think it's really interesting to have like generative deep learning, uh, doing things like creating art. Uh, choosing a model. Oh, this might not, this might have changed URLs or something. <laughs> Don't worry. It was just, uh, it's nothing you really need to see, which is another example of uh, having a, a mouse interact with a piece of food and it was actually doing kind of the instant segmentation. And then when it's like eating the food and the food is on its face, it classifies it as eating. And when it wasn't, it classified as not eating. So there could be many, uh, um, you know, use cases to think about for choosing a different model and different ways of like tying these things together. But if you're just getting started right now, um, just think about what, what's the problem you're trying to solve and what's the outcome you're looking for. So if you are just trying to figure out is something in an image or not, uh, maybe classification is okay for that. Um, if you need more accuracy and or you need like counts or you want to know where something is in an image or video feed, then you could use um, you know something like object detection. If you need to know precisely where something is, then maybe use the instant segmentation. Um, and then also we'll we'll talk about it in a little bit for training. Um, data, but sometimes even training for instant segmentation, even if you don't need it, can sometimes give you a more accurate model. So something to keep in mind too is like accuracy level that you need. Um, all those are kind of factors going into it. But when you're getting started, you know, what are you trying to do and what, what's the actual outcome that you're looking for? Someone said trying to detect if your mouse is cheating on its diet. <laughs> so it sounds great. Yeah, so we could totally do that. So you could train a model on your mouse train a model on the, the either correct food for it to eat and the bad food for it to eat or something like that. And <laughs> you should be good to go. <laughs> I like that use case. Um, so object detection, detection in a gist, um, I'm gonna share an article again, if you wanna go much deeper into it and I will share out the slides later too. So if you wanna dive more into this on your own, you're more than welcome to. Um, but essentially when you're training a, a algorithm like the deep learning model and kind of the other um, uh, uh, object detection models, which I'll talk about in a second. And it just, it, it kind of just finds proposed regions where it thinks something is, and then it's going to run a classifier around it, um, saying like, yeah, that is the, the class. And then it's going to calculate an estimation of where the object is. So it might be like, cool, I think, you know, stuff's around here, 
run a classifier around it. Oh, cool. It definitely seems like, you know, a goose is here. And then based on all the kind of the parameters from doing that, it's going to, you know, figure out where to draw the box or the pixels around on it. And again, um, that's a very high level. You can go more in, into more details in that article or just Google more about it. And I also give you a lot of links at the end. Um, so don't worry, you can go fill in those knowledge gaps. So popular object detection methods. Um, oh, before I get into this, um, so out of all these ones we talked about, um, I know we're going to do object detection tonight. People are asking about more workshops. Um, I always like to ask, what other workshops would you like to see around specifically um, computer vision that maybe we covered here? If you know something we didn't cover, like are you interested in doing more about instance segmentation and maybe we use a different framework like TensorFlow because we're using something with PyTorch tonight? or you want to do uh, feature point clustering or maybe a GAN. What's the, what's the most interesting to everyone? <laughs> Someone said yes to all, this is helpful. <laughs> Someone said feature point clustering, GAN, feature point clustering, GAN, yoga one. All right, so GAN and feature point clustering is what, I, what I'm seeing. GAN, GANs are really cool. Uh, might be a little hard to, to uh, keep in, the, in a smaller workshop, but we'll see. But it also sounds like feature points is pretty interesting. I think that'd be cool. We could probably go through, talk about labeling, and then also how to train a model for feature point clustering. Because it's uh, the whole process is kind of similar to this, but, it, but it'll be a little bit different. Oh, someone said, how difficult is it to do facial expression detection? So it depends. There's a whole bunch of different ways of doing it. Um, and one could be with feature point clustering. One could actually be with like object detection or classification. Uh, like you could actually detect smiles and stuff with classification if you wanted to as well. Someone said, how to use your local computer instead of expensive AWS cloud. <laughs> Uh, that, yeah, like a setup workshop could be kind of fun. Uh, we're actually using Google Colab tonight, and they actually have a free GPU tier that you can do for, um, you know, training your own models. And you get disconnected after 12 hours or something, but it's more than enough time to do kind of hobby type projects. Someone said, how about model performance and calibration? That'd be really cool too. Yeah, yeah, something like that. Uh, we could definitely go more into like ML ops type stuff too, uh, like deploying, keeping track of version control. There's a lot of stuff, you know, that people don't always think about. Like when you first get started, uh, it's often thinking about like just the machine learning side, but there's actually a whole bunch of other steps. So someone said, how difficult is it for eye gaze? I think a lot of that depends on you know, like where's the camera placed? Like how far are you trying to track a gaze? But that's a pretty big field right now. Like all the VR headsets are trying to do kind of like eye detection or like where they're looking and stuff, as well as I imagine some other physical spaces potentially too. Cool, awesome to hear all the ideas and I'd love to hear more later. Uh, I'm just gonna keep going for now though. So popular object detection methods. Um, we have single shot multi-box detection uh, detector uh, or abbreviated to SSD. It does object detection. So drawing those bounty boxes or rectangles around it. And it tends to be very fast, uh, kind of a light, lighter weight um, solution. Um, but it doesn't always have as high of accuracy as some of the other ones. So there's, you know, you wanna research to see which one um, Oh yeah, I'll open this up in a second. Um, so, and then you have YOLO or you only look once object. It also does object detection. It's also pretty fast. And then we have something called a mascar CNN. There's also a fork of this called the faster mascar CNN. Um, it can do object detection, image segmentation. It tends to have really high accuracy, but it's a little bit slower. So sometimes when you're choosing a model, like we were talking about, what is the end solution? Are you deploying this on some sort of low powered edge device? Or are you okay with maybe it being, you know, not incredibly fast? Um, you're okay doing like 15 frames per second versus 30 frames per second and not doing like super, super live uh, detection. Um, you can kind of think about all those factors when choosing kind of an object detection method. Um, yeah, and I'll share this link in the chat. I'm also going to open it up real quick. And this is what we're going to be using today is something called Facebook Detectron 2. Um, and it's actually a fork of uh, ma uh, the faster mask RCNN. So it's really accurate and can actually do a whole bunch of stuff. So I'm going to show you how to label your own data set in various ways. Uh, even though we're going to focus on object detection, I'll bring up in image uh, segmentation 
instance segmentation as well, um, in case you're curious about training a model for it. So here you can see it's got this kitchen and then it's doing object detection around all the things, right? It's saying like cup, potted plants, a bowl, person. And so this model is pre-trained on the, the Coco data set where all these things are already in there. And then uh, you saw it, uh, Detectron 2 can also do feature point. So we can also, I, I could briefly talk about labeling for feature point, but I won't go too deep into it. Um, and then it has something called dense pose. So this is kind of like the feature point clustering, except for it's actually drawing a 3D character around uh, where the people are, which is cool. And so I've seen people talk about using this for, you know, animating and stuff like that now, or, or game characters. And then here it's doing instant segmentation. Again, not just drawing boxes, it's drawing just the pixels of where something is. Like you can see the cups on the dining table. And then it has this, uh, blanking on what it's actually called. I think it's described in here, um, uh, pan panoptic feature uh, instant, instant segmentation, I think. And so instead of just doing the objects, it's also detecting the background. So this is really good if you're trying to give your model a little bit more context of what's going on. So if this was like outside, you could see, I think sky, um, it, the Coco data set might have like skyline of like cities on there. If not though, you could train your own model for something like that. Uh, but you can see it's doing like cabinet wall. Uh, this even says wall tile behind them, which is pretty cool. Um, I, I used this pre-trained model and did like a little promo with it with me like in a kitchen. You can see like classifying like refrigerator and microwave and stuff, which is pretty fun. So this is actually where we're going to use today and learn how to bring data into it to kind of get all these features on our own problems. Sound good to everyone? And it, it's, a, it's a fork of the mask or scene or faster mask or scene. And that's why I can do the image segmentation as well as object detection. Um, any questions on that so far? These different types, Detectron 2. How's everyone feeling so far? We're almost done with the slide portion. So we're gonna get to hands on stuff pretty fun or pretty soon and hopefully it'll be pretty fun. Uh, what is the best model someone asked um again it really depends on your use case so like the the faster mask or cnn might be the the more accurate one but if you need to deploy it on like raspberry pi or a pi a raspberry pi with a gpu or some sort of tpu uh, you might need to use something like yolo or single shot multi-box detection depending on kind of your final state of the model Someone said, which is better for which scenarios? I mean, kind of the scenarios I talked about, it really depends on the kind of accuracy and deployment that you're looking for at the end. Not like one isn't necessarily better at, you know, cars versus geese or something. That's gonna really come from your data. And there's also like, I'll talk briefly about this. There's also an underlying classifier you can choose. So typically you're, you're choosing like something like a single shot multi-box detector, but you're also choosing something like a ResNet 50 or a, a VGG or a mobile net. These are kind of like different convolutional neural networks on the back end. And then you have the single shot multi-box detection as another layer. So there's actually multiple things you can kind of choose depending on what you're trying to do. And that's something you'll learn as you go. So, you know, that's, there's a lot of kind of knowledge in the industry and uh, a lot, a lot of times you've learned kind of just by doing and like what will work best on your data set. Uh, you could try multiple ones out as well and see which one gives you the results you're looking for. So I said, do you know any good OCR technologies that can stay in documents, uh, scan documents for missing text or handwriting? Um, so there's a library called uh, Tesseract. I think Google maintains it now. And that's the most popular OCR library. Um, often you can use that library in conjunction with something like a deep learning model. Um, and you might have it detect like where something is and then you run an OCR model on that thing specifically, but that might work well on its own potentially depending on what your use case is. And I actually um, can go over some resources at the end if you're still around on OCR uh, that might be helpful for that. Because I've actually been doing some OCR stuff recently myself. Um, if not, connect with me and uh, ping me. <laughs> All right, so the, the full computer vision lifecycle. Um, remember I talked about how often people just talk about machine learning side of things, but they don't go into all these other steps that are actually super important. Um, so you can think about you have device management, 
uh, where either you're you're managing the edge computing factor, like I talked about deploying on you know uh, NVIDIA Jetson or Raspberry Pi or some sort of other computer somewhere, um, or a cloud computing device, right? Like you need to manage these resources to actually run your model on once it's trained. And then you also typically need to manage sensors because most of the time in the real world, you're 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 also getting data from sensors uh, either real time or at certain collected scheduling times. So in this case, for computer vision would be a camera and you're running a camera stream and then you kind of want to adjust that data and then you want to label it and then train a model again with it. So you have the kind of device management side, data collection side, so managing the data from those cameras or, or different machine learning or uh, sorry, different sensors to use for machine learning. Um, and then you need to kind of parse through that sometimes, like if you're collecting camera frames, you might not need everything in there. Um, you only need the, the images with, with cards or whatever you're trying to label. So kind of creating separate data sets. Sometimes the data collection is also like web scraping. Um, and then data annotation, like we're going to cover these two things in bold today is like how to label your data. So once you've gotten your data, how to label it and then how to do the machine learning portion, um, how to train a model for, for whatever, you know, we're going to use object detection, but you want to do all those steps of like selecting the model, like all the complicated stuff I was just talking about with like ResNets and um, um, SSD or YOLO, whatever you're going to choose. And then once you do that, uh, several people have asked about deployment. That can also be a really tricky thing. Once you have a trained model, how do you get it to work in the real world? Um, uh, so running a model on either an edge device or a cloud device. Um, so like if you're running in like Google Cloud, or if you're running on that um, uh, NVIDIA uh, Jetson, Jetson Nano or some sort of uh, NVIDIA GPU. And then typically you want to repeat for continuous machine learning. Um, and the reason why I want to repeat, I, I think I brought up before the workshop started, but right, like uh, imagine that you're doing something in a store detecting people walking in, like the Amazon Go, for instance, or whatever. And you want to see when someone walks in and kind of track them through the store. Well, if you train your model during the summer, people are going to be wearing different clothes than they're wearing in the winter. So like people might come in with the shorts and tank tops and like no big hats or no hoods on or something like that. So your model could be really good at good at detecting people in the summer. <laughs> um, but then if winter goes around and people are wearing big puffy coats and different hats and you know um, long pants and boots and stuff like that, that would be stuff the model has probably never seen before and wasn't trained to detect on. So it might do okay detecting the persons there just because it does maybe look close enough to what it was trained on. Um, but chances are it'll have higher accuracy if you keep training the model with current data. So a lot of times you'll have um, you know, a deployed thing doing those detections, but you're also keeping all the camera data coming in and then having someone label it or have um, kind of AI assisted labeling help you there and then retrain a model with all the new data coming in. And that's going to um, probably give you a, a, a like, a, it, it's gonna maintain your model kind of through the year, right? So it won't have what's called model drift where eventually your model just ends up not being as accurate as it once was because things change in the world, in the real world, right? Like things are always constantly evolving, like what people are wearing or, uh, you know, if it's snowing versus sunny out and lighting and all these different things really affect um, computer vision models quite a bit. So here's a little sample, like, you know, edge device, video capture, data prep, data annotation, model building, edge deployment, and the kind of like, you kind of keep this thing going a lot of times. And not to be super salesy or anything, but we have a really cool platform that can do all these steps. And uh, don't worry, we're, we're not actually going to use the platform today for the model building. We're just gonna use, use part of it for the labeling. Uh, but if you're interested in something like that for your business, potentially uh, feel free to fill out a contact form here or email me at sla at sixskill.com. And we can schedule a demo too, if you want to see it. Um, also, we do like model building. So if you are looking to, um, you know, get a com complex model built and doing something like object tracking or someone was talking about uh, manufacturing and stuff, um, let me know or, or let us know there if, if you have that need. And you can just also go to sixskill.com, kind of explore around there and see some of the other stuff that, that we're working on. All right, is everyone ready to do some labeling? Super exciting stuff. It actually is pretty exciting if you've, uh, that sounded sarcastic, uh, if you've never done it before, like I was super excited to actually do my first kind of labeling because it really, really does open up the door of you being able to solve all sorts of problems, right? Like 
uh, even if you don't have any in your, in your mind right now about what you want to do with computer vision, um, knowing how to build your own data sets is a really important skill. So again, um, you can go sign up there if you want. I'll give everyone a minute to do that. Where's my tab? Did I lose it? Okay, now I got my tab open here. And we have some really cool features that make labeling uh, much easier. So we have like AI powered uh, labeling features that are really cool and some more coming soon, which I can talk about. So labeling probably used to take, uh, or maybe was a little bit more boring and, and we're making it way more fun and easier in my opinion. So I'm gonna give everyone a second if they do wanna sign up. Um, and I'm gonna pull some images I have locally, but also show you how to bring in a couple, uh, one you could upload a image locally yourself. Um, and I'll show you how to bring in a couple kind of through an image search API. If you wanna just play around with it, we won't be going through all the labeling because labeling still does take time. So don't worry, I'm not gonna label hundred images here. I'm just gonna go through several images um, just so you understand how to label your own data. Um, that way after this workshop, Hopefully you'll be like, cool, now I wanna go do something with my own data, whether it's just detecting your pet because everyone has photos of their dogs or you wanna detect you know, animals in your backyard or, or, or uh, someone was talking about manufacturing, like you could upload your data into this and uh, label it how I'm gonna talk about, export it, train a model like, like I'm gonna show you with uh, Python and Detectron 2 and actually have like a pretty cool working prototype. So that's my hope is uh, to give you all kind of all the tools and knowledge you'll need to build your own your own model. But I don't want to spend an hour labeling data or anything here live with you, because that probably would get boring. But it could be good to follow along a little bit. Um, so just give everyone a minute there. All right. Um, if you're in here, again, you don't need to follow along right now, um, but I think it'll, um, I'm just gonna go through all the steps that I think you'll, you'll need to build your own data set. So here, uh, if you just logged in, uh, you won't have all these kind of sample projects. These are ones that I uh, have used or that I've been working on. So I'm gonna create a new data set though. This is what you would wanna do. So you just hit this new data set icon here. Um, and as a quick note, so you'll see these other kind of grayed out uh, areas of the, the product. And those are like what's coming out with uh, when I talk about this whole life cycle in a platform. Um, so coming soon, some of these will might be unlocked. Um, and then again, if you need a whole tour or you want that right now, let us know with that, that contact link. All right, I'm just gonna hit new data set. And so for this one, um, I'll call it geese. I'm actually gonna <laughs> upload uh, not just geese cause I wanna show it on different data types for you here. Um, but typically, right, like if you're going to label it for um, manufacturing and QA or some of the other kind of ideas people have, like, a, you know, other wildlife or whatever, you could just name it any project you want. It doesn't really matter. I try to keep it concise so you know what's in there. I'll say geese and more, <laughs> just so I know. And then I hit save, continue to um, uh, sources. So I'm going to add a source. So right now we don't have anything in here. We want to add some sort of data source. So you can hit add a source. And what this is going to do um, is give you all these different options. So here for this workshop, I'm going to upload local files. Uh, what I should do probably for a future one is make a public bucket that I could give you a link for, and then you could get all the same data. Uh, I did not do that today, uh, but keep that as a note for next time to myself. Um, but we also support data from Amazon S3, Google Cloud Storage, you know, common places that you might store images um, and, or, and data sets and bring those in. So here I'm gonna upload a local file. And again, you could do this with an image if you have one on, on your computer. I'm gonna hit uh, sort files alphabetically because I have some video frames in there and I actually want them to be in order that they were broken out in. And I'll, I'll show you what this looks like in a second. Oh, and as a quick note, so for choosing local files um, right now, it only does images, but video is coming very soon where you'll select a video and be able to kind of say how many frames per second you want broken out from that video. Um, and currently I believe that is supported in the S3 buckets and Google Cloud Storage. So a lot of people using this in enterprise world actually use um, you know, Amazon S3 or Google Cloud Storage, not just their <laughs> local computer. So that was a, a more of a priority to get the, the uh, video support in, in these ones, but the, the local one's coming soon. 
Oh, and then real quick, so I uploaded these images I'm going to show you. But if you want to bring one in by search, you can hit this image search. And I'm just going to say goose. Um, you can kind of adjust some parameters here. I'm just going to go ahead and hit search. And I'll hit, I'm going to bring you this, this picture of a goose. Oh, click on the image. Um, I think right now, if you click on the check mark, it actually doesn't check mark it. So just click on the whole image here. And then add selected image. So you could do this if you want to search something and bring a couple in just to play around with yourself. Add selected, selected images. And you can see that we have um, 11 images here uploaded uh, that we can now label. So I'm going to hit save and continue to label definitions. And this is where you, um, <laughs> someone shared a goose data. I also have the goose data set on my GitHub if you want it. I should have had that linked. Um, I, I'll get that in a second. So here, um, I'm going to create a label. So this depends on you know, what you're trying to do, right? So we talked about classification, object detection, instant segmentation, feature points. This is the important part of like, OK, what am I trying to do here? What do I want to teach my model? So if, if we were doing object detection, we have this rectangle selected. Um, and I'll talk about these other ones in a second. So I'm going to make several examples just to show you. Um, typically, most of the time in the models, uh, you'll have one type um, because if you have polygons and you're training a model with it, even if you're just doing object detection on another one, um, it's probably taking, I think, polygons as an input. Um, or typically, I, I keep them the same anyway. Um, so here, though, I'm just going to go ahead and say goose. I'm going to leave it as a rectangle. You can change this color. This is really just for you as the human while you're labeling. So if I know the goose is on a green background because it's green grass, I may be having something like blue is easier for me to see as a label. So I'm going to hit save. Let's create another one. Um, I'm going to say goose uh, polygon. And then hit this little polygon selection. Let me change the color again to something that would be visible. Boom, hit save. Uh, I'll make a couple other ones, cow, polygons. And uh, even if you are training a model, like I was saying for object detection, um, sometimes polygons tend to be more accurate. Like if you are going to train for object detection, you still might want to train a uh, mask or scene in with polygons if you, you're trying to get your accuracy up. So a lot of times I use polygons. Say pig, I'm just kind of making some stuff up here. And uh, let's do one more. Oh, so I do have an example I'm going to show you with a rock, which is really cool. And I'm going to make that a polygon as well. I'll make that another blue. We already have some blues. Let's do, let's do a pink. Hit save. All right, so we have all these different labels now. And now we can go into our data set and start labeling them. So just hit uh, save and start labeling. Uh, real quick, forgot to mention this. So you have labeling instructions. This is actually really cool if you're working with a team. Um, even if you're not working with the team, leaving yourself instructions can be good. But the reason why this is often really important is you have people labeling data that might not be an expert in that field. So imagine doing medical data and you're labeling some type of tumor or something. Like if you gave me those images, I wouldn't know what I'm looking for. I would need someone to tell me what I'm looking for. Um, and then potentially have references. So I could be like, I'm not quite sure if that is one. Is it? Is it not? And so you can add in these instructions by typing in and embedding images of like examples of like, this is, this is one that's properly labeled. This one's labeled improperly. This is this type of uh, tumor or whatever that it is that you're looking for. So you can leave uh, really detailed instructions if you want, or just kind of simpler ones maybe for yourself if you forgot like, you know, all the different things you're trying to detect and like what type of label is expected for each one. So it's really good for team collaboration. And this is an online tool. So you can invite a whole team into your organization and actually go through and label those images. And there's even a, a review thing I'll show you if you're interested in. So hit save and start labeling. And this will bring up our images here. So we have images of geese real quick. And if I'm labeling for object detection, what I want to do, right, is just select my rectangle bounty box. And uh, typically, so you want to be as close as possible um, most of the time to your goose or, or the object that you're, you're labeling. So here, I'm going to draw a bounty box around it, right? I want to be pretty accurate. And it would look like this. You can zoom in and out and kind of pan to where you want to zoom in. Um, it can take a little bit of getting used to, but it's actually pretty nice once you get used to it. Then here, I'm going to label another goose. and. Ta-da, 
if you did this on, I know you don't have this exact image, but if you did this on, you know, maybe one of the images you got through the search API, um, you labeled your first image for computer vision, which is awesome. And uh, a really important note. So if you're labeling for like object detection or image segmentation or anything like that, um, what you want to do is label every instance of it. So here, if we had another goose back here, right? Or maybe let's say even right here. Um, and I didn't label it, the model would have a really hard time understanding what it's trying to learn. Because if I label these two geese and it was like, cool, cool, I think I'm learning, you know, what a goose looks like. And then we said, like, by not labeling this other goose, essentially we're saying that, um, uh, that it wasn't a goose. And then it would look over there and be like, well, all these features match what I'm trying to be looking for. So um, it's really going to confuse the model. So it's really important that you label every instance. It's not going to do a good job of understanding the objects. If you only label a few in an image, you need to label all of them in an image, inside of an image. Um, one thing is like an exception would be that if a goose was like really far away back here and uh, we were okay with our model not detecting that as a goose, then you could think about that. Like, you know, I only want to detect if they're pretty visibly a goose, but I don't really care about ones that are far away. But really important is to essentially, as a general rule of thumb, label all the instances in your, your data set. So once you have that labeled here, um, hit submit, and this will go on to the next image. So now we have this image of a car, and uh, you know you could you could select um, all, you know, if you're doing um, object detection, you could select all of them by doing this. And again, you'd want to do like every instance here. Um, but let's do polygons real quick. So here, I'm going to delete these. Uh, you can select the label, hit backspace or delete, and I'll delete it. Let's do a polygon. Um, I didn't make one. So, so we're going to use the, the cow label, pretend it says car right now. Um, and this is how you would label for a polygon is you want to draw around it. So you know you want to capture every pixel that's in that that's part of the object that you're trying to label. Um, I did a terrible job there. You want to be pretty close to it just like labeling with boxes. And I'm just going to be very quickly here, but typically you want to be you know very accurately uh, drawing around the object. Uh, once you come around, you then connect the polygon. It'll kind of light up the label color. Click and then you have this polygon here. Once you have this, um, you can hit escape and uh, select it. And you can go in and adjust all these too. So if you want to come in, you know, bring this in closer, you can even add new points there. You can also delete a point. So if it got too, if you made too many points, um, you can select one and it turns white like this and then hit uh, backspace and delete and it'll delete those, those points. So you can come in and customize this as much as possible. But a cool thing is like, I did a pretty terrible job there. Um, and this, this shape isn't that complex. It's almost just like a rectangle. So drawing a polygon really isn't that hard here, uh, but it still takes a lot of time. If I was doing this around every car, um, that's really going to add up, right? So we came up with a really cool way of doing this. And this is where our AI powered labeling comes in. You can select this icon right here. This is going to enable something called smart poly. And what that does is smart polygon selection. So now we click on our label. And we really just kind of label how we would a bounding box. So you want to be as uh, very close as possible to the object here. Draw a square around it, encompassing the entire thing. And then boom, automatically drew a polygon around it, which is really cool. And again, this shape isn't super complex, but if you're doing it a lot, um, the time saving is really going to add up. And you can see here, even if you aren't OK with this not capturing the um, side mirror here, again, you can go in and just you know, quickly adjust something if you wanted to. So if the smart polygon doesn't work 100% on all of your data, um, you know, it's still typically, in my experience of using it, like way faster, even if you have to go in and adjust something um, really quick. So again, if I was actually labeling this, I'd want to do it for every instance here uh, to train my model. But I'm going to go to the next image just to show some different types. So here's a cow. So drawing a, um, Drawing a polygon around this would take a lot longer because I'd have to go in, go down, go up in here, right? Like this is a much more complex shape. So again, I have smart poly enabled. Let's draw a square around this. And maybe I got too much grass. Nope, that worked pretty good, right? That's pretty awesome. And if I needed to go in, like if I wasn't OK with that, I could go in and, and uh, adjust the labels. And that would still save me in a ton of time.
Yeah, so someone said, wow, that button is amazing. It is awesome. Um, I've been using it all the time on all my projects now and like, I can't imagine doing manual polygons again. <laughs> like I, I spent a lot of time in the past doing polygons because they take a long time. Like if you're labeling this picture of a cow, drawing a polygon, I can probably label all three of these cows faster than doing one polygon manually. Even if I had to go in and adjust some of the data. Someone said, is this detecting edges? It's actually doing more than that. So we actually are using uh, deep learning behind the scenes. So we actually have a model and this is something we can keep approving upon as well. Let's go to the next one. I'm just gonna show a few more examples. I know, you know, we'll get into the code portion soon. Um, here, boom. Um, and and this will work on a lot of uh, data. If you have some really noisy data though, like if these pigs were on a, a really crazy background, almost the same color of dirt or something, and a lot of cracks and stuff in there, um, the polygon might have a hard time like figuring out where it was. It surprisingly works um, a lot of times, even when I think maybe it's too noisy. So always give it a try. Um, and then occasionally you just, if you don't have a really, like if it doesn't work for whatever reason on your data type, you can always go back to the manual polygon. That's why you can toggle it on and off. Because too, if like it worked really good on most of my pigs, but then for some reason, one of them, it just wasn't working too good. You can always go in and then manually draw them. Again, I don't do that. I just did that as a quick example. Um, so someone said, so you have your own model trained on identifying different types of objects and you're applying it to new shapes. Yeah, so that's where it gets really complicated, right? Because it, it is a model that's trained on a diverse set of data, but um, you know, there's always chances that maybe there's something, it does a surprisingly good job on a lot of stuff, um, but potentially there's something it just won't work good on. If that happens, let us know and then we could uh, fix it. Oh, someone asked a really good question is, can the bounding box overlap will it affect accuracy? So yeah, so um, well, let me real quick just show this and then I'll talk a little bit more about that. That's a great question. So here, um, <laughs> This was a, a project I was working on is actually detecting foreign objects in this conveyor belt with food. In this case, it's like tomatoes. So it's like harvesting and processing all these tomatoes. And it's a problem, um, you know, if something got in there like a rock in this case, uh, you know, people might not want a rock on their salad. Hopefully there's other steps before these potatoes go on a salad. Um, but we want to detect if there's a foreign object uh, in here or not. So let's go ahead. We're going to use smart polygon again to kind of select where this rock is. So I'm going to label it. And this is a really, really cool time saving feature is, is it, uh, what, what I'm about to show you. So here we have our, our rock labeled. Now I'm going to enable something called track forward and it's in this little drop down. Hit track forward here. And can anyone guess what this is going to do? So these are uh, frames from a video. We labeled the rock. Now we hit track forward. And now I'm going to go ahead and submit. And we have a new frame, the rock moved, but the label is still applied around it, even though it's a different shape. And I'm gonna hit submit again. And again, the label is there. Um, if I needed to adjust it, I could come in and adjust these uh, polygon labels. In this case, it actually did a really good job, right? Even with all this noise in the background, like this isn't a, uh, um, a very simple task, even though the rock looks different. Like we don't have our models and trained to specifically detect this in this environment. It's just automatically doing it. So we labeled a rock in one frame and then we essentially just keep hitting submit in all these video frames. And it's going to track where that rock goes and automatically um, apply a label to it. And again, like this one, you know, maybe we want to make that a little bit better so you could come in and just kind of expand these out. Hit submit for, for the next one. And boom, even, even though it's moving all over the place, we're tracking it and we're applying a label automatically to it. So this is really amazing talking about, um, uh, oh, and we even detect if we moved on. So I didn't tell it that we weren't doing, the, doing that rock anymore. And it was like, that's not the same as those other images at all. Uh, you're not doing track anymore. So we're able to bring in like video frames uh, label once like on a first frame and as um, you know we can we can track at uh, track the object as it goes through which is really crazy so imagine instead of doing polygons manually for every single frame you do one smart polygon 
on the first frame and then just keep kind of hitting submit. And then um, you kind of want to QA it, right? So that's why it isn't just automatically applying all the labels yet, though uh, that's going to be something I think we're, we're working on too, where you have an option of like, if you trust our model or your own model in the future um, to do stuff like that, then, then um, you could apply all those labels. But right now it's labeling and then you kind of want to QA as you go, um, adjust the polygons if needed. And it's a huge time saver. Any questions specifically on labeling? Uh, it doesn't have to be any of the types we cover, just kind of anything, especially in the tool set, like if you want to go use this, um, was there anything that you're kind of curious about I didn't talk about? Uh, oh, and I'll go through a couple other, other steps real quick to get like how you would get this out of here. Um, one thing to note here, so you would hit um, all images if you want to look at everything that you've already labeled. So by default, it's just showing um, pending images. So this is useful if you go into a large project with hundreds of images, um, you just always want to see what's pending so you can continue labeling. But if you want to go look at all images or even submitted images and you want to review these, you can individually go through. This goes back to the team management thing where you could have other people labeling and you want to come in and actually you know, go through and make sure they labeled it correctly and then approve. Oh, and someone asked, um, someone asked about can bounding boxes overlap? And yeah, so if uh, geese, if these geese were close together, and I can maybe show other examples of uh, in the data set later. So if I if these geese were close together, I'd want to label it like this um, with this, you know, going over this goose, even though it covers part of this, um, it it'll generally do a good job of segmenting out like this is one goose and just you know know that this is another one. But this is also where polygons come in and, and one reason why it can be better. So if you have really noisy data and a lot of kind of stuff overlapping, instead of having bounty boxes being trained on whatever's in the box, you can actually explicitly train it on a polygon of a, of a goose, for example. So something to keep in mind, yeah, um, you can have overlap, but if your data is really, really, really crazy and complex, then uh, maybe you want to just look at using polygons for it. All right, so once you have your whole data set labeled, you go to this review tab, just hit save. Um, and you you can't, if you're working as a team, you can also batch like, you know, approve from here and stuff if you want to. Uh, but for you, if you're just working on your own project, mostly you just want to export your data so you can use it in Python uh, or whatever, you know, deep learning framework you're using. Um, so I'm going to hit export project. This is really cool too. Um, a lot of labelers, at least that I've used in the past, don't have all these export types. So my mouse froze. Um, so here we have a, kind of a generic JSON, which is like, if, if you're using something that doesn't support out of the box uh, formats, this can be really useful because you can almost always customize a framework to take in um, any type of data. You have create ML classifier and object detector. Create ML is Apple's uh, deep learning or uh, machine learning framework. So you can actually kind of directly export to them. If you want to train it on a Mac, you can look up uh, create ML, how to get started with that and uh, export for that. Coco is very popular. It's the one I personally probably use the most um, and see the most. Um, you can read more about it. I, I have some links later too, if you want to look more into these types of data sets, so really just JSON formats um, that a model or a framework will expect. So you're going to feed it, you know, links to images and the coordinates of the polygons or where those bounding boxes lie. You have yellow specifically for you only look once object detectors and then Pascal VOC, Pascal VOC which is a, a pretty popular one as well. So just this example, I'm going to hit Coco. So, um, and we're, we use Coco in our um, Detectron 2 notebook today. So this is probably what you're going, going to want to export to. If you train your own data set or label your own data set and you want to train the model how we're going to do it today, you'll want to export in Coco. So just hit export now. I'll say it's completed. And then you get an email like this and you can just hit download from there. So I'll just download a zip file. Um, also, you'll get a not notification in the platform see, did we get one? Uh, that was a test one I did a little bit ago, I think. And uh, if you don't get one immediately, uh, it, it'll push up here, but you can always refresh and then it, it should show up with the most recent one. So I did that and then here it is 26 seconds ago and I can hit download export from there. And then inside your export file, 
you have uh, these four things. I'll talk about test, train, and uh, validation uh, a little bit more in depth in the code because we're going to train our model uh, using all these. Uh, but it, there's an image folder and three JSON files. And again, those JSON files just kind of map the coordinates of, of your labels to the images. So in, in this case, it's a whole bunch of images of geese. And if I looked in that JSON file, it looks uh, something like this. It's just really crazy. Again, don't worry about it. Don't be scared of it. It's just coordinates for bounding boxes and where they lie on the pixels of images. Um, uh, does anyone have any questions? I'm going to open up for questions before we get into the, the code portion. And you'll be surprised because we can actually totally go through, train a really awesome object detection model um, in like 30 minutes or less. We'll still, we'll still have time. Someone said, um, how can we see the recording? So I will send an email out, but I'll also give you the link where it will be at right now. Uh, YouTube link right here. Here you go. If you want to give us a subscription, cool. Um, and all the kind of live talks I'm going to be doing, and I plan on doing more, will be uploaded there, um, as well as uh, um, potentially just other videos. I think I'm going to try to do tutorials um, on computer vision stuff. And also, we have a whole bunch of cool demos up here. So a lot of the stuff I showed in the slides um, are on here. So if you want to just like look at cool stuff and see examples, Here's one where we're doing, uh, you know, ripeness and strawberries, another cool agriculture feature. Um, so yeah, feel free to look around in there. There's also some some ads, <laughs> uh, but there are. Uh, it'll come up. Um, I'll add it probably tomorrow, hopefully, potentially at the, the Friday, or by Friday. Yeah, I will explain the code. I mean, I like I'm gonna go through that next. So I'm just. If you have any questions about labeling or anything we've uh, just covered right now, let me know now. And, and then if not, we'll get into the code in a, in a second. But I'm gonna wait like two minutes. So um, if you have any questions about labeling or do you want me to go over anything I, that you think I, I didn't yet? Someone said, can they use computer vision to learn how diseases, um, like how they spread or I feel like one words. Oh, navigate. Um, I don't know. I mean, if you can see it <laughs> in the body, I'm not sure what data. I mean, like if you're doing MRI scans and you can track certain things like that, like that's not my area of expertise. And I'm sure it's much harder to see a disease. Uh, but if you have some sort of medical imaging, then uh, that can see that, then I would imagine you could use computer vision for it, right? If you're doing, if you have anything like visual um, that you can see really well and that you, you can think you can do with your eye, um, chances are you can train a model to do it. Someone said, is the coding portion going to be uploaded? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm still recording this one, so uh, I haven't stopped it. We're going to go into the coding next. But hopefully, y'all don't just leave and leave me alone. Also, it's great to ask questions uh, during it. Someone said, can we load the annotated data set into this tool to visualize annotations and correct them or review them? Great question. Um, I believe that is on, on our roadmap. So right now, you can upload, um, if I go back to my, sorry, my home page. Uh, right now, you can import a data set that was labeled with um, Sense, or uh, the product here. Um, but we don't have a way of just importing a, another Coco data set or something from a different tool. But that is something on a roadmap. So I love that idea. I think it's really cool, especially if you're migrating over from you know, another tool and you spent time labeling with some other labeling product and you don't want to lose all that. Uh, it totally makes sense to bring it into this tool. So um, that'll be something coming. I, I don't have a um, timeline on it, but it is on our roadmap. Oh, and another really cool thing I didn't talk about on the roadmap too is uh, automatically labeling images. So you know, either using... Um, pre-trained data sets where you could look at an image and see how many you know, cows are in it or whatever and automatically apply labels to it. As well as in the future, um, we're talking about having it where as you label, you can kind of train a model and then hopefully your model will get good enough as you're labeling 
to apply those labels for you, which will be really cool. So kind of like a bring your own model or um, you bring your own data in and train a model while you're, you're doing it and have those automatically applied. That'll also be a, you know, a game changing labeling experience, I think is essentially for labeling, right? It's not necessarily the most fun thing to do, even if it's fun for a little bit, after a thousand images, you probably are bored of doing it. So if there's any time of speeding that up and making it easier, um, it also tends to save companies a lot of money because if it takes a lot of time, you're usually paying someone for their time to do these things. <laughs> someone said, can you use it to trick a CAPTCHA? Uh, you haven't. Uh, if you're training a model, I guess, to detect letters or something, right? Like, and, and not specific to here, but just computer vision in general, um, I'd imagine. The CAPTCHAs are there because they're tricky, right? Like if like typically it's some letters, but they all look crazy. They're not just very specifically like an A and stuff. So using someone brought up OCR, which is object character recognition. Um, and it's not very easy to detect those types of letters. Oh, someone said due to network issue, they got disconnected after joining. They lost all the text in the chat. Can I please share all the links again? Well, I won't go all of them, uh, but I, I have most of the links at the end that I can, um, share to you. Um, I'll actually grab those right now and throw them in the chat and then everyone will get this uh, in a second. So hopefully this will cover everything you need. And then also um, I'll do a follow-up email. So you should get links links later if, if this isn't what you needed. Or you can follow us on Medium. I'll be posting a lot of cool stuff there. We actually did a, a really cool post around, um, I don't know if anyone saw the Super Bowl ad of, uh, um, of uh, counting Mountain Dew bottles. Uh, this is actually a really fun little read of showing kind of like how, to, you know, all the uh, problems you might face in doing a, a computer vision project, um, including like tracking and stuff like that. All right, so it, seems like, it seems like uh, questions have calmed down. So I'm going to go to the next part. Um, oh, and, and uh, for that person who lost everything, if you wanna sign up, for the data annotation tool in case that link wasn't in there. I'm gonna share it one more time. All right, is everyone ready for the coding portion and to get, get your hands uh, on some code? Everyone's feeling good. Everyone's like excited for computer vision. All right, uh, real quick, just to talk briefly about some libraries. Um, so there are so, so many libraries that you can, that can be used for computer vision, uh, but just want to note like five that you're definitely going to see as you get started. Um, one is PyTorch. We already talked about PyTorch and TensorFlow. They're kind of uh, machine learning frameworks and they're just, they, they essentially kind of do the same thing. So you'll often see PyTorch use or TensorFlow use just depending on who's uh, uh, doing it and maybe specifically what you need for deployment. PyTorch is maintained by Facebook um, and TensorFlow is maintained by Google. Um, and you'll often see TensorFlow plus Keras. Keras is kind of a wrapper around TensorFlow, uh, but now they're actually in the same library. So TensorFlow 2.0 just came out, I think it was last year, and Keras is actually part of it. Uh, but it's just kind of a, a way that makes it easier to write TensorFlow code. Kind of like how there is a framework now called PyTorch Lightning, which is kind of a framework around PyTorch that makes it a little bit easier to write PyTorch code. And then Detectron 2, which is kind of its own thing, but uses PyTorch underneath, and it's kind of another a layer. You have OpenCV, it's a really awesome library for image processing and computer vision. You have NumPy, great at processing multi-dimensional arrays, which is actually what an image becomes when we load it into Python. You have a Pill or Pillow, which is a, another image processing library. All right, so I'm gonna share this link and I want you to open it up and then make your own copy of this notebook and you'll be able to run all the code. Uh, you can mess around with it as much as you want. You like, and if you break it, then you can just come back, like you could bookmark that link, come back to it and just make another copy. So don't be worried about really messing up your own copy. Um, and it's totally okay if, if something doesn't make sense. So if you've never done Python before, um, if you've never seen any deep learning stuff, you know, there might be parts where you're like, I don't know exactly what that is, uh, but that's totally fine. Uh, that's part of learning something new. So don't, don't be scared of it. Um, and, and you don't need to memorize everything that I say or anything. Just you know, try to remember the high-level concepts. You can you know, go Google it later if you need. And then mainly just be awesome to yourself and others. Um, but a lot of the code is there. So don't worry, you shouldn't be getting too many errors or anything. Really just 
I don't want anyone to be like scared of anything they see that looks really complicated. Um, you can always learn about it and break it down later. Um, and, I'll, and I'll break it down as we go. So if you're not familiar with Python and stuff, um, I'll actually go through and talk about it. So here, once you're here, uh, what you want to do is hit file and save a copy in drive. And it might take a minute um, and it should open up in a new tab. Sometimes you get a pop-up saying it's ready. Um, so everyone go ahead and do that. And I'll wait a couple of minutes or a minute or so. And if a couple people just want to say they did it in the chat, just so I know that it's working, that'd be great. Someone said done. Awesome. I know at least it worked for one person then. Great. Saved a copy. Great. So it's working. Did anyone have a problem? Occasionally these problems come up and people don't say it. So if you did have a problem, let me know. People are saying done. Okay, cool. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what this tool is. So even if you're still doing it, um, uh, uh, you'll have you'll have a minute. So this is a Google Colab, and Colab is essentially Google's way of hosting what's called a Jupyter notebook. If you've never used one before, it's a really popular tool in data science. It allows us to write code, documentation, and output visuals kind of all in one place. So it's really really cool for experimenting and sharing with people like kind of results of stuff. Um, it's a really unique way of kind of programming, but also having visuals and documentation in one place. Um, really fun. If you've never used one before and you are thinking about going into data science or anything like that, chances are that you're definitely going to use a Jupyter Notebook. Um, so again, save a, uh, save a copy in your drive if you haven't. And um, to edit the text, once you have your own copy, you can double click on it and you'll get a, a view mode like this. So you can write in what's called Markdown. If you've never uh, wrote in Markdown before, it's just kind of a simple way of formatting text. Um, it's very common in programming to use in readmes in different places. So you can do kind of mark, Markdown formatting. So if you wanted to take notes as we go, you could even do that in here. And then you hit Shift Enter to get out of this mode. Shift Enter will bring me out. You have code cells. Um, so here, I'm gonna go ahead and run this code cell. You can see like I click on it, this uh, play button, or even if I don't click on it, this play button appears as I hover my cursor over. So go ahead and hit this play button. The first time you run a code cell, it'll take a minute because it's actually spinning up and connecting to a whole little, um, you know, like server on, on Google's part. So once the first thing actually runs, everything won't take that long to run, but just the first one can take a minute. Um, once you are connected, you'll get this little check mark up here. Um, and let me know if that ran for you. So we, we said hello world in Python. If you want to add a new code cell, you can hit this plus code. If you want to add a new text cell, you can hit this plus uh, text and you can move them around. So like if I wanted to put more text somewhere, hit these little arrows. Um, it's a really cool tool. So someone let me know if the code ran because then we really know we shouldn't have issues if you can run code on your copy of the notebook. Did anyone run Python? Did you get your hello world? All right, Mark says, all good here. Great, that's all I wanted to hear. Um, and if you've never done Python before, you now did your first piece of Python code. Not sure if we have a lot of Python programmers, uh, but if not, now you can add uh, you know, Python to your LinkedIn. I saw you do. All right, so we, we had our code running. Um, just a quick note, so also in Colab, in these code cells, you can actually run uh, like Ubuntu or uh, Linux bash commands. So you actually have kind of a whole um, uh, instance of, in this case, it is Ubuntu going on. So if you run this, and don't worry if you've never done bash commands before, you don't really need to know what they are for this workshop, but I want to point it out. So you can actually uh, do things like ls is listing, listing everything in your directory. Um, here, I'm just going to go ahead and run these and we'll talk about them. Um, so I'm going to run this. This is installing PyTorch. Um, it'll actually say all the uh, requirements are satisfied. The reason why I have this code cell in here um, so Google Colab comes pre-installed with a whole bunch of the common 
uh, data science and computer vision libraries. So it actually has TensorFlow and PyTorch already installed. Uh, but sometimes Google Colab will update to the next version of something. So they might go to PyTorch 1.8. And our code here might only work with 1.7. So this code cells in here kind of in case you come back to this later and they do update it. And I didn't update the notebook or anything yet. Um, this should go ahead and install the, the required libraries. We're going to install a couple more dependencies. If you've never used Python before, pip is a common way of installing libraries. So a lot of stuff is built for Python, but it doesn't come installed by default. So sometimes you need to bring those in. Like I said, Colab already has PyTorch, but if it didn't, you would do something like pip install. Here we're installing PyYAML. Uh, YAML is a, a kind of a, a data type that we can uh, uh, read. And then PyCocoTools, because we're actually going to use uh, Cocoa Data. And this is just kind of telling us the version. I had this here as a safety just to see like, what was the version of uh, PyTorch? Just if it was a different version um, than you needed, then uh, you could go and install different ones. So here I'm going to pip install Detectron 2 now. This can take a minute, but it shouldn't take too long. And uh, don't worry, you might get these little things, these little errors or, or warning saying restart runtime. Don't worry about that. Um, you don't need to do that. Uh, but that does remind me as a quick note. So if you are creating your own Google Colab and not making a copy of mine, you don't need to do this right now. I'm just gonna show you. Um, you can go to runtime and you can go to change runtime type. And we have a GPU selected because uh, we wanna use a GPU for training our model. But if you weren't, uh, if you just started a new notebook, uh, it wouldn't have a GPU by default. Uh, it would have none. So you can go into runtime, change runtime type, select GPU, and they give you a free GPU, I think for something like 12 hours, um, but it does vary what GPU you get. So it's not super uh, reliable for like production things or anything, but it's really good for experimenting and learning. Here, we're just gonna pip install pillow, which is used for visualization. Again, don't worry about the warning. I think everything's fine. Um, and then here we're going to import. So we install things. And again, if you just haven't used Python before, you install libraries um, some, somewhere and then you want to import them into your project. So here we're importing like Detectron 2 and, and some specific things from Detectron 2 that you see we're going to use in a second, as well as some other libraries like NumPy, like I said, was really good for multi-dimensional array. CV2 is uh, OpenCV. It's named CV2 when you import it in. creating a data set. So I just have, um, you know, if you share this with someone else or something like that, they can go through and kind of see some examples or the signup link is here. Um, and again, uh, it'd be cool if you want to join the Slack channel, ask me any questions and share your project on there. I'm just going to share it again here. I also link to our documentation. So we have a docs page if you're looking for more information about, you know, the labeling product or anything. All right, so here, um, these cells, because for this workshop, uh, it's kind of hard to get everyone coordinated to upload their own data set or label and upload something. So what we're doing here is we're actually just Git cloning uh, my Goose data set. So I said I was going to share that later. And um, this is actually where that data set lives. So if you do want to go look at this, it's on my GitHub. Share that in there. If you want to follow me on GitHub, you can do that here. Um, all right, so let's just, we're going to use ls, that bash command, to look real quickly in the directories. We can see that we downloaded an image folder and then a test, a train, and validation uh, JSON. And we can see, you know, here are all of the image paths. All right, so now we have our data set. Oh, oh let me briefly talk about um, how to bring your own data set into this. So because we, we did get clone because it's really easy for the workshop, right? We can do it very quickly. Um, there's a couple ways of bringing your own data set in. And... Um, the easiest way is like, you could just go to your download folder, you know, have your whole folder of, uh, you know, all of your keys images or whatever. And you could just like click and drag this into, not this section, you wanna click this folder section here. This shows all the content um, within your instance. And what you actually can do is just, you know, drag your whole folder that you had exported into here. Um, and then all of your data will be in here, but, if you're if, if you think that you're going to get disconnected from the GPU runtime or it's something that's going to take you just a lot longer to work on, what I'd recommend is uploading to Google Drive. So you can just go to your Google Drive page, um, create a folder, you know, just on your homepage, or you could create like an ML folder or something. And then um, 
uh, upload your contents there. And then what you want to do is you can hit this. Uh, your, your shouldn't have the X through it right now. You can hit this icon here and it'll say connect to Google Drive. And since this isn't your own note notebook and I've already connected to this multiple times, so it's already fine with it, you'll get a code cell that looks like this and you can run it um, and it'll ask you to go to like another link and get some sort of authorization token and then paste it in. Once you do that once, then you should be able to just hit this icon and always kind of mount and unmount your Google Drive. And here I have my Google Drive. I have like an ML um, folder. And let's say I have a uh, data set somewhere, a data set of a candy project I was working on. And um, these are the, the variables you would want to uh, change. So this is how we're importing our Goose data set, right? We have the, the train JSON, the validation JSON, and the test JSON. And we want to point those all into our code here. Uh, so Detectron 2 has something called register Coco instances. So it knows how to read in that Coco formatted data. And then we can train a model with it. So we have my data set train, my data set uh, evaluation, my data set test. These are all kind of variables we can use later to look at our data set. And then we want to give it links to where that data lives. So in this case, you don't need to change this right now because it's pointing to the Goose data set that we just downloaded. But if you were bringing in your own data set into your own folder, once you can navigate like this, it's really easy. You can just navigate to where it is. And uh, we see, you know, I have my Coco folder here. And in this case, I only have one, um, I, I forget why, but I can hit copy path. And what I wanna do, if, if this is my train training JSON file, I would just paste in that path there. And then in this case, if I, if I was doing this candy one, I would also wanna change the path to where my photos live. And this is important. So the path of the Cocoa data set is going to be looking for slash image um, and then that image name. So you don't actually want to give it directly this image folder. You want to give it the folder above that image folder. So like where my Cocoa data set is, I would copy this path and then paste it in here. And I would just do like usually most of the time um, I just export one project with the training, the validation, the test. And I'll talk about those in a second. Um, and then so all these would be the same path here and I would just uh, repeat it. And then I would have these the different paths to the specific JSON file. So it sounds really complicated, um, but once you do it once, it's pretty easy and uh, it's cool because it can just live on Google Drive. You can always just come back to that data set. So I'm going to go ahead and run this. And what we did is we now created kind of three data sets, the training, the validation, and the test. And I'll talk about those as we train our model because training our model will take a few minutes. And um, I'll fill that time with talking about some of that stuff. So here, now we'll just, you can go ahead and run this code cell. What it's doing is just taking three random samples and then drawing out the coordinations. And really important to do this, especially if you're writing your own custom um, import code or something for your data set, because I've done this in the past where I accidentally had like my values reversed and it would have drawn the box like over here instead of around the goose. And if you don't look at the data set and you're trying to train your model, your model's never going to learn from that data because it's just awful. And um, so always checking your model is, is super important or, or checking your data set is always super important when, when you bring it in. And so it's just saying for D in random sample three, uh, read in that image file, and then visualizer is kind of something built into Detectron 2. We're just going to automatically know how to write out those coordinates that are going to get returned. We'll look at what is actually returned from a model. Um, it's really just coordinates, and then you can use a visual, the built-in visualizer library, or you can use your own uh, visualizer functions, which is what I often do kind of in the real world. Um, so if you got this, cool, it means your data was loaded correctly. Did that work for everyone? Uh, often someone has some sort of error. So I just want to want to double check or you all are doing really awesome. And um, if you do get an error, this code should work. So if you do get an error, uh, see Ron, you didn't tell me. Um, if you do get one, <laughs> uh, what you want to do is like, you probably just forgot to run a code cell. And then also a common thing that comes up is um, if you ran this code cell once and try to run it again, it will throw an error because this data set's already defined. So those are probably the two options where you got an error. Um, if you are getting one and you weren't able to continue in here, um, go up and make sure that you didn't miss a code cell. Because they do all need to be run, most of them need to be run in order. Um, and it is common for someone to just kind of skip over one. Oh, and so you can hit this play button or you can hit shift enter if you're in this code cell.
Yep, so we got the assertion error. That happens a lot. People will run this cell more than once and uh, you only want to run it once. I mean, it's okay if you ran it twice. It won't, it won't harm anything. Uh, you'll just get that error message. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, run these cells and then I'll talk about them because it'll, it can take like five minutes or whatever to, to train the model. Go ahead and just hit run. Let's just make sure that some output starts coming out and then I'll talk about what's going on over here. All right, cool, we got some output. <clears throat> so um, there's the, you, you're, you're already in your notebook, so you have all these links. I'm not gonna share them uh, in the chat, but you have links here to the actual Detectron 2 tutorial. So if you wanna go more in depth on stuff that's going on there or uh, how to load in custom data and stuff, that, that's covered there. There's something called a model zoo and I'll, I'll show how this is used, but this is essentially, where you can select um, different types of models. So when we talked about using like object detection models, like single shot multi-box detector with a mask I've seen in, or with a mobile net or something like that, um, all those things live in here. So you look at this giant list of different models that you can use. Um, and then in our case, we're going to use one for object detection. Uh, but if you wanna change that out, you can go look in here, kind of see all the options available. Um, and then here, um, so, and I'll, again, I keep saying I'll talk about, I'll talk about validation in just a second. Uh, one thing I don't like about Detectron 2 is it doesn't have a super easy way of uh, doing a validation while training. So you can read this blog post here. It's kind of a way of doing it. And that's what we're doing here. It's essentially, we just made our own class in Python. And uh, what this is allowing us to do is when we train here, um, so we have three data sets. We have train, validation, and test. And what we want to do is train our model on train, and then we train it for a certain amount of time. And then we typically like we'll test that model after it's trained to make sure that it is working to the accuracy that we need it to. Um, but the problem is sometimes you're training models for quite some time and you don't know how good your model is doing because it'll give you some metrics about like how good it's doing on the training data, but almost all the time your model should be improving on the training data because it's it's seen it. So it should be kind of overfitting to those samples, saying like. I definitely know what a goose is in this picture because I've seen it 300 times. But um, if it's not, if those metrics aren't getting better, then chances are like your data is bad or not good enough or something for the model to understand it. Um, but what you want to do is as you're training after a certain amount of uh, iterations or epics, we want to see how well our model is performing on data it's never seen before. So we have this training data set. When we exported it, um, I think I forgot to mention it, but it, it's exported by default 80% as a training, 10% as validation, 10% as test. So we're using most of the data to train our model. And then we have a validation data set that as we're training, and this is what's happening right now, um, you'll see these kind of metrics being spit out. Um, every 50 iterations looking at our data set, it's going to now look at a data set it's never seen before, which is the validation data set. It's not learning anything from it. It's just comparing like, how accurate am I getting? So you as the human, it's kind of like uh, for you to see it, that yes, your model is continuing to improve on data it's never seen before, um, which is super important because if it's not, and it's just overfitting to only the data it's seen and learning from, um, that's chances are it's not gonna work in the real world when you deploy this model somewhere. So it's usually really important to have a validation data set while you're training a model. And here I'm gonna, talk about the configuration of setting up how to train a model into Tektron 2. So you have this little uh, config variable, CFG. Uh, you just say git config. This initializes the configuration into Tektron 2. And then here's a CFG uh, merge from file. And this is where the model zoo comes into play, where you could select different models from here. Here we have one Coco detection. It's using a faster mask or CNN. And then this uh, 101, uh, I believe is in reference to the size of uh, ResNet. So don't worry too much about it, but typically the larger this number, I think 101 is the biggest one. It's kind of the, a bigger um, uh, classifier architecture underneath. And so you might, you might need a smaller one if you want it, this deployed on a smaller device, uh, but a 101 will probably give you higher accuracy. And then here we're passing in our training data set. Very, uh, very important to have this comma at the end. I think it's so you can pass in multiple training data sets. Um, if you don't have the comma though, uh, it'll throw an error and it took me for a long time to troubleshoot that error. So hopefully that will save you some time. Uh, it's because it makes it a tuple data type and it's expecting a tuple data type. 
number of workers. You don't really need to worry about this. This is for if you're doing like distributed training across different GPUs, you have these options of uh, optimizing your code to run on it. And then this is important. Remember, remember when we talked about uh, transfer learning and getting pre-trained weights? So this is actually where we're doing that here. We're saying model zoo dot get checkpoint. A checkpoint is like, um, you know, wait, like it's a, uh, a, a save state of a model. And so here we're getting a checkpoint URL from the model zoo. And you want this to always match up with your model that you chose here. Otherwise it will throw an error and it won't do anything. So if we're doing the, the, mass, the faster RCNN um, cocoa detection, we want this to be exactly the same down here. And this will give us those pre-trained weights. So we're not starting from zero and we're going to throw in geese and get a pretty accurate model quickly. Uh, images per batch, uh, this is, uh, you can adjust this, just how many images are read in per batch. Um, again, kind of some optimizing stuff. A learning rate, if you learn more about deep learning and computer vision, you'll learn about a learning rate and how to, you know, potentially pick better ones depending on your situation. Um, this will probably work a lot of, for a lot of your data that you throw in, but if for some reason it's just not learning well, um, you could try adjusting this. Uh, this is important, so the, the max iteration these are kind of how many times the model's gonna go through your data set. So uh, we're only doing 300 in this case, and you're gonna see it's actually gonna work pretty good. But if you have a much more complicated data set and many more variations, like the, the Canada goose look pretty similar to each other. So it's actually gonna learn pretty quickly what we're looking for. But if you have like 10 different types of cars or something, uh, you might need to throw this through a lot more iterations. So you could try um, incrementing this up if you're not getting good results. Um, you know, go to 500 or 1,000 or whatever. You're just gonna have to play with it depending on your data set. ROI, uh, it's regions of interest um, per batch size. So if, I think this is like, if you have, um, uh, you know, 30, this goes, allows up to 32 geese at a time in one image. We're not anywhere close to that. I think the most we have is like three or five or something. Uh, but if you're doing way more, you might need to adjust this. And then this is super important. So if you're doing more than one class, you want to change this. So it's, it's set to one right now because we're um, detecting just geese in this instance. But if we're doing geese and ducks separately as different classes, then we would have this two. If you're doing you know, 10 different cars, you would have it 10. So this is really important to change to however many classes you're trying to, to detect. And then this is really important to change because you, you'll probably want to add more if your data set's more complicated. This is just creating an output directory. So our model that we trained is actually now saved in um, this little output folder in our instance. So we have this model final.pth, that's a, a PyTorch um, kind of model extension. And then down here, this is um, how we're using our, our uh, class up here, our evaluator class. So this is every 50 um, iterations that's looking at our validation data set. Uh, so you could adjust this too. If you don't want to do it every 50, you only want to do it every 100, or you want to do it every 10, uh, you could change that number here as well. And then we have this trainer variable, and this is actually, we'll now pass an image into this trainer variable and get some sort of results returned. And if we look at the output here, up at the top, um, I won't go too in depth, but this is actually just the complicated big ResNet architecture of the classifier. You can see that we have 260 geese uh, instances um, and I think we only loaded 100, oh, 110 images or something, uh, but a lot of those images had more than one goose in it. And then you can see as it trains, it gives up some data. So here as it's training, this is the training loss and um, kind of accuracy, different metrics. Um, I have links in this notebook that you can read more about different metrics for deep learning and computer vision as well. Um, but you typically you wanna see loss going down and accuracy going up. And then these metrics are our validation ones. So these ones here saying AP stands for uh, average precision. And I have a link a little bit later to talk some more about it. Typically you just want average precision to go up though. That's kind of like your accuracy score here. Um, and there's variations of it. So you can see that um, after a few epics, you know, our total average precision was only 40. And then it goes up to 60, it's good. It means it's going up and then it jumps all the way to 77. That's pretty good. And then at the end here, let's just see what it says. It's at 81, um, so that's awesome. So now, if you've never done uh, computer vision before and your model's done training, you trained your first model. So give yourself a round of applause. That's super exciting. Uh, did, did, uh, did people finish training? Because sometimes you'll get a lower power GPU than the one I have and it might still be training or something now.
let at least, at least one person let me know if it trained or it did not train. <laughs> I'll keep going though, because I know we're, we're just slightly over time. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and run this cell. Occasionally, people tell me in the workshop this won't work for them. Don't worry if it doesn't work. It doesn't hinder anything else we're going to going to go through. Um, but uh, it just might not show up for you. But this is just a quick way of seeing how your model did um, in visualizing those results. So like average precision, you can see it's always going up. That's great. If you could see the model potentially going down and back and forth or where it plateaus or something. Um, and it does look like it's still going up. So even if we added more iterations to our uh, model right now, which is that data set, we might get a, a, a more accurate model, probably, because it looks like it's still going up, didn't really straighten out yet, and it's definitely not going down. Um, there's a lot of other stuff you can poke around in here. It's just a, a nice way of visualizing your training results, but I won't go any deeper right now. Um, I can come back to it if people want after the workshop. So let's go ahead and run these code cells. I'm going to go a little bit faster just because we're over time, uh, but again, I will be happy to come back to anything because I will be hanging out. Go ahead and run these. Um, this is just now we're loading in our model. So it's very similar to how we set up for training, except for now we're saying instead of loading the pre trained weights, let's load our own weights. And remember that was saved to that output folder. So we have output um, model final. Um, if you changed folders, I had it saved somewhere else. Again, you can just go in here, copy path, and then um, you know paste it in there. Or you could upload a file or a, a model from somewhere else. And then again, the important thing is like number of classes. We only have one in here, but if you train a model on two, you want to change this to two. And then here, um, this is really important for you. So the first time you train a model on your own data set and you're not sure how accurate um, your, your model is going to be, you might want to lower the threshold here. But this is telling our model to only draw the rectangles around it if it's 90% confident that in this case it's a goose. But if our model just wasn't that accurate, because sometimes you get a model that's only 80% or 70%, and that might be OK for your use case, um, you just want to change this. Like This would be 70, um, this would be 80, this would be 90. And then we're going to get our predictor variable. Um, this is actually the thing we're going to get to uh, pass our image in, not the trainer one. Sorry, I think I said that earlier. And then here, let's go ahead and run this. We are setting this variable to this test image. We're reading it in with OpenCV. Then we're getting outputs. And we'll look at this in a second. This is what's actually returned from our model. Um, we pass the image into our predictor um, variable. And then we're just kind of visualizing out, uh, writing out the image. That's all this is doing. And you can see, so 99% sure that's a goose. It's 95% sure this is a goose. So did you run that? And did you get a result? If so, super awesome, especially if you've never done computer vision before, you've now done a really cool model that can actually do object detection, not just classification. If we look at what an image looks like to the computer, right? We just have this giant array of images. And this is where I was saying it's actually a multi-dimensional um, array is kind of how Python sees the image. And these are just pixel values of colors, actually. I just wanted to show that because it's kind of cool. If I run this, this is actually what's getting returned to us um, from the model. And often, this is actually the really important stuff. Like, you don't always need to visualize it to have an alert or something. The visualization is awesome for us humans. It's also really good, like, it, to share on your LinkedIn or anywhere where people will see it, because people love seeing computer vision models run. They're really awesome looking. Um, but oftentimes, if you have an algorithm making the decision, like, it's not actually looking at the photo. What it's doing is it's looking at this. And this is all the data being returned out of our prediction. So you can see we have some information about our image. We see how many instances were detected. We know that it was you know, two geese. Um, and then prediction boxes. This is the coordinates of drawing the rectangle. So like this goes here, and then, then it, you know, that's where it estimates the gooses. So you would actually have an algorithm just look at this you know, and be like, if you're doing um, distance monitoring or something like that, you could say, uh, you know, if any of these pixels overlap with the other bounding box, then do like collision detection or something like that. And then you also get the score, so how confident it is that it was a goose, and then predicted classes. So Python starts indexing at zero, like most programming languages. Um, so if you had goose and ducks, uh, like in this case, goose would be zero, and then ducks would be one. Um, here's a quick little application, right? Like. You know, this is just returning the counts. This is pretty cool. You could have a wildlife monitoring thing 
and always uh, ping you, you know, when there's at least one goose or whatever, and then it could tell you how many is there, and then you could do something with that information. Um, like actually, if you're detecting people in a room, right? Like this is already good for kind of some COVID restrictions. If you can only have 25 people in a room of a certain size, you could have a model running. And if more than 25 people are in there, you know, send an alert to you or something. Um, so I'm going to go ahead, just run this other example. See, it did a good job, even in this more complicated environment that it wasn't trained in. So there's actually, um, or I guess it was trained in out, uh, on my GitHub, there's a GitHub repo about this Goose data set, and there's a reason why. I'll talk about it later if you want after the talk, uh, after this workshop of like why there's geese photoshopped in my living room. Um, so evaluation metrics. So we saw how it was doing in our validation data set, which is cool. Often you want to use that test data set that we never looked at um, to make sure that our network is or uh, our model is still good. And the reason why is because the the validation data set is for you, kind of like the human in the loop. Um, to adjust hyperparameters in your model. So you don't want to have any overfitting happen in the model itself from looking at all the data. And then you also don't want to overfit your tuning to the validation data set. So once you're done with all that, then you want to run on a test data set that you never looked at before while training your model. So this should be something you're only going to uh, run metrics on once you're pretty confident with your model. And again, links aren't here. So if you want to go more into the metrics and stuff like that, you can totally read more about it. But this returns um, average precision on data that it never saw before. So now um, you can quickly, let's just run all these code cells and I'll quickly go through them. But this will give you the, the fun result and we'll download a video in, in a minute. So running detection on a video. Um, here, this is just displaying a YouTube video. It's just some geese walking around. Um, all this data set. Uh, this data set is just for me taking um, pictures at a park over the summer. And uh, so you, you can build a data set just like with your cell phone taking pictures. And then I just had a, this video that I didn't use during training or anything, but it's geese in the same park. Can't tell if they're the same geese or not. <laughs> um, we pip install a library called YouTube download. So it allows us to download this video easily. Uh, but again, um, uh, I'll show you in a second. You could just upload your own video to Google Drive and then copy the link over. So here we download that video. Um, I'm using a library called FFmpeg here to break the example in, or the video into six seconds. Um, this video isn't very long. We don't really need to do this, but I left this in here because it's really nice to be able to do this um, on a longer video. And the reason why is it can take a while, like this video is short, but if you have a video that's a minute long or two minutes and you're writing a model out to, it can take a while. And then, and instead of taking all that time and then realizing you did something wrong, uh, you could do it on six seconds, make sure it's working like how you thought it should be working. And then you can um, uh, go and run out the whole video. So here, if I wanted to change the video path, uh, what that did was that created a little clip called uh, video clip.mp4. But if I wanted to, oh, and, and this actually is looking at the entire video, not the clip. But if I want to change this out, you just navigate again to where your video is and you can just hit copy path and then uh, put that here. So if you're doing this on your own data set and you have your own video, you have your own model, uh, you would change this out to whatever video you want to run the model on. And this is doing some stuff with um, OpenCV. It's getting, the, it's capturing the data. That means it's you know capturing it from the video. It's getting stuff like width, height, frame rate, number of frames. You can do different stuff with that data. Uh, we have a variable called Video Writer, and it's using something called in uh, OpenCV called Video Writer. So we're going to essentially take all the frames from that video, run a model on every single frame, and then write that frame back out to video. And that's how we're we're using the OpenCV Video Writer to write out that video again. So there's other stuff you can mess around with there, like frame rates and stuff. We're using a uh, video visualizer from Detectron 2. But again, you can write your own visualization functions because you're getting just those four points returned. Or if you're doing instant segmentations, you're getting um, uh, kind of a mask returned of where the, the polygons are predicted. And I actually tend to write my own uh, visualization functions because I think it's cool to be able to really customize them and do whatever you want with them. Uh, but we're not doing that here. We're just using built-in ones. And then we're reading the number of frames. And then while there's still frames left, we're going through. Uh, we're getting those outputs like we showed before um, from our predictor. We're writing it to a frame in OpenCV. Um, we're uh, we're uh, writing the output now. 
the, the drawing those instance predictions to the frame. And then we're kind of just yielding the visualization out. So it's, it, it's doing a for loop here on that video um, and then passing out the fr individual frames and um, we're writing them here in this video writer. And then this is some st common stuff in OpenCV, you kind of close out stuff. And then here we uh, are downloading that out.mp4. And um, if I open this up and you should have a similar video, we now have a goose video with detections happening. Wait, actually where they are. And it's, yeah, really accurate. Like there it's going down different angles and stuff will vary, but it's often it looks like it's around 99% uh, percent on most of them. So we did that, congratulations. You did something that is not easy, um, uh, like training a computer vision model kind of from, from beginning to end. And you even know how to create your own data sets now, bring that into something like Google Colab and uh, run all the stuff on it which is awesome. And uh, I'm gonna hang around and kind of close this up, but I'm gonna share all these links in the chat again. If, um, if you wanna stay connected in all these different places, please do so. Um, all right, what was I gonna say? I think there was something I was gonna bring up. I forgot, oh, so this is a variable where uh, if you don't wanna save it as out.mp4, you could change this file name as well. But that's kind of it from the workshop perspective. Sorry, we went a little bit over. Um, it varies on time because of questions sometimes. Um, I'm gonna stop recording, but I will be hanging out for a while and just answering any questions you have. So please feel free to start posting questions.